one, we have here on the stage today five true leaders who are creating new nations. I'm very honored to be able to have this conversation with you today about building a new nation in a globalized world. Also because I have a personal connection to this particular topic. My name is Wendy Dent. I'm an investigative journalist. You might have read some of my scoops on Trump Russia published by Guardian US. But what a lot of people don't know about me is I was actually born at a time of the emergence of a new nation. I myself am a child of an independence movement. I was born in Papua New Guinea, which neighbors West Papua, at a time when they had just achieved self-governance. A few months after my birth, they achieved independence. It's a country in Melanesia that's so close to my heart, so it was a privilege to be able to invite to harass us the leader of the West Papua independence movement, Mr. Benny Wenda. I went on uh, in a journalism degree to graduate in Sydney from communications at the University of Technology, Sydney, and in my time after that, I ended up filming undercover in Zimbabwe about the Robert Mugabe regime and became to know very closely the incredible work of one of the most underrated women in history <laughs> that should be a name to everyone, the winner of a French Legion of Honor Award, Sekai Holland, was a co-founder of the Zimbabwe opposition movement from the time of independence, of, of, lip, of liberation, yeah? She has a remarkable story. Also on the stage today, we have a minister from Somaliland, a new nation not Somalia, next to, who has a remarkable tale. And then we have here Vit Jadlika, <laughs> who is the president of Liberland, a new nation bordering Croatia and Serbia. And we also are joined here by Stan Stalnagar, who is the founding director of Hub Culture in United Kingdom, which is serving new nations by assisting to create their identities digitally. And he has a, a wonderful point of view on these matters. It also, though, highlights that we have here a very intriguing sort of Maslow's hierarchy of needs that at the heart, everyone here is seeking liberty. We are all here today to talk about liberty. But we have here Benny Wender, and Sekai Holland are in their nations dealing with the most difficult issues of survival, of creating a nation that can have food and security. And then at the, and also to some degree, Vit will speak about the, the challenges his country is facing. But then we have uh, a nation like Somaliland, which fortunately is in a more secure position. Uh, and Countries like Liberland and Somaliland are able to reach at a higher level of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs to think about a digital utopia and how we can create a better world for citizens. But let me have them tell their stories, remarkable stories. Uh, firstly, I will go to Mr. Benny Wenda from West Papua. Wow. <clears throat> I want to welcome you with my language called a wa, 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 wa. This is a greeting from the people of West Papua. Um, I'm, I'm thank you to the uh, co-organizer of the uh, uh, Horacio, and uh, this is the right place to be here uh, because the theme of the, the meeting is the, the global vision of community, how that become a reality, if it's community. That's what we will hear. And West Papua is a western half of the New Guinea, and also, you may know that uh, this is the right place to be here. Maybe this is the first time I've come to this country to conquer this, uh, island, uh, this country because Portuguese and uh, Spanish uh, conquer the uh, island of the New Guinea. So New Guinea is uh, western half of New Guinea, north of Australia. Uh, you know, they conquer uh, 
Guinea Bissau, and they found these new people, like black people in the, in the Pacific, and they call them New Guinea. So that's uh, become an, a New Guinea, New Guinea Island. So eastern half is called Papua New Guinea. They already got independent, now called Papua New Guinea. Western half is a West Papua. And sadly, you know, the colonizer divided this island, two, split two, just like someone bought the cake and let share it. This is your, you have your have, have me. So the Western half is now uh, from the Dutch colony, now we are still under the Indonesian colony. We are still fighting for independence uh, from Indonesian colonialism. So its colonialism is ended, but col colonialism is still exists until today. Why? Indonesia are uh, uh, sadly journalists from international uh, journalists. For example, Amnesty International, Red Cross, NGO, ABC or BBC, totally banned and uh, Indonesia massacre, 500,000 women and men and children has been killed. While I'm speaking, they are still, uh, in, you know, still fighting. So this is the right place to become a global community to share what our own experience, like this panel. We have a different struggle, different fight, but the end, we want to save the, the global community, become a safer place. That's why my fight is your fight, your fight is my fight. Some of you trying to invest your investment the, the, you know, the globally, but we also, I myself, trying to find the uh, people who are you know, invested to, to, to my country, but at the same time, my country uh, also, uh, we are still fighting colonialism. So this is a very tricky, situation where I'm coming from. We are not fighting for uh, uh, economic justice, but we are fighting for colonialism. We have a resources. Whatever you go to Africa or Caribbean or Pacific, we are rich. West Papua is a more rich in this planet, this planet. And West Papua also the second biggest island in this planet after Greenland also the world uh, second uh, large uh, forest. But all these multinational companies come working together with the Indonesian government, destroy our way of life, our survival, destroy our environment. That is what we are fighting. The, our fight is not something, but we are fighting for the, our political independence. 500,000 women and men being killed by Indonesia, enough is enough, and I need you to become a voice of the people of West Papua. Every individual can change this world to a better place. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, let's hear from Minister Awad. Please tell us about how Somaliland came into being and your background. Uh, thank you so much, Jenny. So first of all, I have to thank you know government of Portugal and Kashkias and also my friend uh, Frank Jorgan who has invited me to come here. So uh, it's when I'm just I'm right now representing Somaliland government. I'm the minister of investment. So uh, I have to thank all that. So Somaliland, I think many of you don't know about Somaliland. Maybe part of you knows about that. But let me brief you about Somaliland. Somaliland is located in the East Africa, or what the world called Horn of Africa. So we have boundaries uh, in Djibouti, Djibouti from north, and Somalia from uh, east, and uh, Ethiopia from south. And north, we are just located in the, on the Red Sea. So Somaliland came to the existence, uh, it was, uh, uh, in, in 1884, you know, British colonized. We have been called Somaliland Protectorate. So in 1960, we got the independence uh, uh, from Britain. So the Somalia that everybody knows got the independence from Italy. So we are the uh, same clans, same language, and same beliefs. So our, uh, our fathers and our uh, grandfathers decide to join Somalia without condition. You know, all the time, uh, 
uniting and union is uh, you're going to be strong something like that they, they have been believed something like that at that time before the U uh, european union we, our grandfathers decided to join somalia to make great somalia but without condition they have taken everything uh, like a uh, president prime minister uh, speaker of uh, parliament all the ministers and we have been happy because you know at the end, you have to develop your people. You have to utilize uh, your resource. You have to exploit your natural resource. But you know, a, a, a dictator Siad Barre took off at the power and destroyed the whole country, especially the north. Uh, I mean Somaliland. So again, we decided to fight to gain uh, and to get back our uh, independence. In 1991, uh, Somalia uh, central government collapsed and we, uh, we, we declared our independence at that time. Uh, you can imagine my age at that time. So I, have, uh, I started the first class of school at that time. I never seen, you know, Somali flag. I never seen Somali soldiers. I, I have never seen in my life Somali government. But I, I came uh, to the existence Somaliland flag, uh, Somaliland police, Somaliland uh, military, Somaliland currency, Somaliland constitution, studied, grow up, uh, and even the last nine years I have been uh, uh, in the tax administration, and right now I'm the minister of investment. I am just the decision maker. So I know nothing about Somalia, but the wall, the wall is uh, still, you know, uh, <coughs> insisting that you are part of Somalia. And I have never seen in my life Somalia. So I'm just uh, saying to the world, uh, uh, saying that, you know, Somaliland is safe to be a nation like you, you know. So let me share uh, to you how I came to uh, uh, Portugal, you know. Uh, my passport is not recognized, the paper is with the picture. No, no, no country in the world is recognized except UK and uh, Djibouti and Ethiopia. So e EU, they, they don't <laughs> recognize my uh, papers, that papers, identity papers. I just uh, requested from Djibouti, our neighbor country, to get some papers with my name as uh, to travel, to go to Portugal. So I have taken Ethiopian Airlines from Hargeisa, our capital city, to, to, to Addis Ababa. Again, to Addis Ababa, to Rome. To Rome, to Portugal. So you can imagine how, how we are suffering uh, in the, uh, you know, and it's the age of globalization and everything mm -hmm. is like that. And still, you know, the wall is closing to us, the door. Mm -hmm. So we are requesting from the wall. We, we are a population of 4.5 million, almost half a million in diaspora everywhere. And, you know, we control our border. Uh, we have 35 soldiers, police, uh, and even uh, my friend, the president of Liberland, he has been in Hergesa. It is more secure, more stable than London, than Portugal, than everything. Uh, all of you are invited to come. I'm gonna receive you in the, uh, uh, the airport. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we won't have any passport issues. <laughs> yeah. come to no, 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 no. Just <laughs> you can get, you know, our visa on arrival. A visa we, on arrival. On arrival. Yeah. We are welcoming everybody to come and write down the story. You will see something you never see in the world. You know, we are almost a cashless society. We are using uh, money payment, uh, money mobile payment is in my here. I, uh, when I'm in, uh, in the office, I can use my mobile uh, to pay the school fee of the children, electricity, water, everything. <laughs> Even, uh, you know, 50% of my population are in the bush or in the countryside. We'll, we'll uh, come to that shortly. So, so, so Somaliland is like that. I think uh, right now you are familiar to Somaliland. So thank you. So next time. Yeah. Okay. I, I want to come back. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you. I want to <laughs> thank you for being here and, <coughs> and come back to this intriguing point about passports and travel because uh, this is something uh, very close to the heart of many of the panelists. Uh, I myself was, was, you know, to my understanding, literally born stateless by being born in Papua New Guinea at this uh, strange time, pre-independence. Um, but I also want to highlight that because 
uh, Ms. Sekai Holland had a, a remarkable challenge just to make it here to speak with you all today. So uh, perhaps Sekai, would you like to uh, tell us a little bit about that and introduce yourself? My, my uh, uh, another Alma from the University of Technology, Sydney. <laughs> this is, uh, as I said, the co-founder of Zimbabwe's independence movement. Um, thank you very much, Wendy. I really think it's a miracle that I'm here. Uh, but I want to start by saying to Frank, I don't know where he's sitting, but what Frank has done is something that the world needs right now. And for that, I really fought to get here so I could be part of this really rich and novel initiative for the future of planet Earth. Frank, thank you very much. I wanted to say also that when I saw the name Wendy Dent, um, my heart really lit up because for me, Australia has been the country where I have found my rising up again when the chips were down. And this is another rising. So Wendy, thank you very much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, I wanted to start this on nation building about that uh, uh, our topic was supposed to be on nation building. And I thought about that in the context of what Frank is talking about in a globalized world, that was now an archaic term, uh, the state. Um, Zimbabwe is also a cashless society. We don't have cash. We use um, eco cash. And I tried to send my husband the money I took out. It doesn't work from here. It only works when you're at home. But I wanted to start by saying that what I have found striking here is the total disconnect with reality, my reality, which is that from the northern countries, we are taught that life began in Africa, and that every human person moved out of Africa and populated the other continents 70, 60,000 years ago. There is no mention of this in any of the discourse taking place in terms of that the era that we are in today requires that all humans find common ground. And the most common ground is our beginnings in Africa. So I hope that people think about that and think about it seriously, because if they do, they will have a different understanding of how we tackle the problems of the future and use this pl platform, which um, Frank seems to have fought so hard to make a reality useful. The next thing that we have together is language. I don't know a language, and I have traveled in all the continents, where language is not a peace-building tool. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night. You can translate that into any language, and you will find that people, at their most basic, wish one another the best. We don't seem to use that tool at all. And I find with my great-grandchildren, they've started to lose language because they are busy with their androids and uh, TV. And they barely ever talk to me. And when they do talk, I don't understand what they're saying. So I have lessons with them on speech as the highest achievement of humans. Um, the next thing that I thought we could tackle in this session on nation building is that the world we have today has been built on the roles that humans have found themselves having, the production, reproduction of humans, and that the men were the ones who had to go out there and protect not just themselves, but their families and their countries and their borders. And I was really excited, Frank, to meet Jasper talking about another form of how armies can be used. And I hope we build forward with that, because army is also an, an obsolete expression of nation building. I just wanted to end here by saying that for me, in Africa, the most hopeful sign is our youths. 
and I've met them here from Africa. They are so beautiful, boys and girls. They're part of the world going forward. And I was in a session which played out how I used to be when I was young, 50 years ago, a few, more than 50, 60 years ago. This young man just kept bouncing off, and I was really scared for him because he lives in America. And knowing American society as it is today, and it needs a lot of healing like Zimbabwe does, um, I just feared that when he goes back, he will just get himself shot and killed for being so mouthy. Because the ideas he was expressing were actually factual. But the way you express your ideas, I have learned over the past 76 years that you have to use peace building language, peaceful language, so that you get to the other person and you connect that humanity and you move forward. Concluding on Zimbabwe today, Zimbabwe is the bad boy of the planet. And it's really something that the young man was trying to talk about. And I was so shocked that a young boy from Nigeria living in the United States could capture what's going on so beautifully. In the 90s, Somalia was a real problem. I may use the wrong term because of the division that is there now. But Zimbabwe on the continent has one of the most brilliant armies. It's a liberation army which then got trained in Sandhurst and has the tools of both the guerrilla and the modern army. They were called to Somalia under um, UN peacekeeping, UNISOM. I call it UNISOM. Yeah, yeah. There was UNISOM 1, UNISOM 2. And the Somali uh, people had wiped out the Pakistani uh, peacekeepers for raping their women. And they had also downed a seahawk of the uh, Americans. Guess who saved them? General Chiwenga from Zimbabwe, who is today's first vice president. But what do you hear about him today? Oh, he's killed a soldier there. Here he's done this, he's done. There is nothing to talk about the role of armies internationally in all societies and how it needs to change in a specific way. That is not this discourse. Again in the DRC, the rebels just totally overran the airport. Guess who they called to come and quell that? General Chiwenga, the first vice president in Zimbabwe. And he got order, he got people talking together and got the thing moving forward. And they got signed in um, uh, um, Zambia in 1999, the accord of uh, peace building in um, Africa, the first one, yeah. that was General Chiwenga. Uh, General Philip Sibanda in Angola brought UNITA and the uh, parties there. So the way in which the army in Zimbabwe is regarded today is not in accordance with the history of what they have done to be where they are today in removing Mugabe, who really became we, a big we, problem for everybody. I think we everybody. have a, a, a comment or a question. Did you want to just, no? no. Oh, sorry, Vit was So I just me. want to conclude by saying on Zimbabwe, my appeal here is for us to use our hearts, our minds, our peace building tools to talk to every nation. And I'm really refreshed because this seems like a nation of the future and uh, Western uh, Papua seem to be nations of the future and yours, and that we should listen carefully. That's really my introduction. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Remarkable. Vijad Lika is the president of a new country, Liberland. It's a remarkable story as well. Please tell us about your country. Well, Liberland is not a big country, but I think it, it embraces a big idea of freedom, and, mm -hmm. and we want to take the, the idea to the limit. We want to give our citizens as much as possible the freedom that they deserve, and we know very well that it works. We know that places like Singapore, Hong Kong, places like Monaco have become the centers of prosperity on this planet. They are now full of people. They cannot fit there. It's very hard to get the citizenship in these places. And when I was dealing with the a simple problem that in Europe we have overregulation and overtaxation, and many people are feeling basically oppressed by the overreaching state, 
uh, we came up with an idea that we have to start a new country. And so on 13th of April 2015, uh, we launched an initiative, we, we launched a new country on a, on a no man's land between Croatia and Serbia. It was a place which was unclaimed for more than 28 years. It was a place which I think was perfect, heart-shaped uh, territory, seven square kilometers exactly. And, and since then, uh, we have grown from basically three citizens that started it uh, to diaspora of half million people globally that believe in our effort, that, that feel like Liberlanders that are systematically one by one getting engaged in the nation building. And we are trying to combine the best elements that are out there for the governance, and that is, I think Stan will be talking about what, what is a possible these days. We have our own initiative to make everything transparent, everything on blockchain. Uh, we also launched our, our cryptocurrency. We were the first country on the planet to embrace cryptocurrency as our kind of national standard for transaction. Uh, and, uh, you know, we are, we are also really interested in, in combining these, all these blockchain technologies with these very good principles that were embedded, for example, in the American Constitution. So 13th of April was the birthday of Thomas Jefferson. It was a time where, where we wanted to invoke kind of a tea party of the modern era, where we know that enormous amount of energy, social energy can be unleashed if the state doesn't take too much of the economy, if it doesn't interfere too much with people's freedom. And right now we're celebrating three, uh, four years actually, uh, in, uh, on Friday, Saturday and, and Sunday. You are very free to join us for this celebration. We are having a couple people from European Parliament, the US Congress. Uh, we are launching our initiative to settle Liberland. We are still having lots of challenges. Uh, Croatia is uh, basically actively trying to prevent us from settling Liberland, but they are not claiming it. And that's, I think, very important thing that has to be mentioned, uh, that we were not uh, born on a territory of another country. We are not separatists in any way. We didn't have to declare independence from anybody, yet, of course, we are a little bit out of the box. We are, uh, I would say, a national movement of a new kind, and I, I think we will see many more to follow. And uh, I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy that I was able to visit Somaliland and, and, and support your national initiative, that we were able to open our office there, that we signed the agreement about cooperation. I'm happy that we had a chance already to meet representative of West Papua, which is, I think, amazing place, and that we were meet, meeting uh, on the UMPO platform, which I think is a very important international body. Uh, where we are planning to be members as well. And I'm happy that Stan is helping us with our mission in Bermuda. And that, uh, they, you know, there, there is so much of a technical background to Liberland as well. The leaders of this new digital future for nation states are with us. And, and that's, mm -hmm. that's it from me. Thank you. Congratulations. It's very exciting, isn't it, to have a new country at this time, especially, you know, this digital future that we're speaking about, which brings me to Mr. Stan Stalnacker from Hub Culture, yes? Please tell, tell us a bit about your organization and your connection to these r really important issues of the world. Thanks, Wendy. Thank you so much. And it's great to see you all here. And again, thanks to Frank for, for gathering everyone. It's been an amazing couple of days. Um, so I am the founder of a community called Hub Culture, which is today one of the longest running social networks on the internet. It was established in 2002, so um, kind of ancient history by internet terms. Um, and the community has evolved over time um, and is now sort of on a trajectory towards becoming a virtual nation. And that has become the kind of mantra and the goal of um, our work as a community. And this is really a function of an idea around self-actualization. For a long time, really since the beginning, our stated mission as a community has been to help to enhance the collective consciousness of the members of our community. And we always work on a kind of real world slash virtual basis. So unlike some of the social networks that are very large, like you, you can think of Facebook or in the past MySpace or Twitter, they're existing really only in the digital realm. Hub culture has always existed with one foot in the digital realm and one foot in the physical realm with spaces or uh, opportunities for the members to gather 
in, in real life. And always with that idea, that collective intention of self-actualization. And so as the community grew over um, the kind of first part of the last decade, we started to run into problems with gathering these people in the places, the hubs, um, where they were members. And things like payments became an issue. We started to think about um, identity. So in 2007, we launched one of the first digital currencies called Venn, um, really two years even before Bitcoin existed. And it was a currency that could be traded within the, the community. And at, at that point, we started to really think about the um, economics of the community and how you start to build tools for value creation within a community. And that really got us thinking about um, really what is a country? And in the digital world, which is the place where we live increasingly and where our children will live, what are the tools and services that a person needs? And how are those different or how are those services and um, needs not being met by the nation state today. And so what you see over the last 10 years, 15 years increasingly is a gap in the ability for the nation state to actually serve the needs of its populations. And so we don't necessarily intend to go and stake land and form a country in the way that Liberland has. But what we're thinking about is how do you build a layer on top of the existing nation state system to create virtual nations and the infrastructure for virtual nations. And so that has manifested in uh, several areas. So the first was the digital currency, which enables a new type of economic activity among the members. And then it turned into digital identity. And in 2014, we launched the first self-sovereign digital identities, where a member of Hub Culture could own their data, own their identity, and then add to that identity to make it usable in, in new ways. And so this provides a kind of digital passport for our members to be able to um, you know, access goods and services or, or to, to use it. Um, most recently, we've been working on AI uh, to really think about security and defense. Like I think that the militaries of the future in the nation state realm will evolve into AIs. And so we realized that in the virtual realm, a protective sentry AI was going to become very important. So we've started building an AI in 2017. It's a kind of general protectorate AI for the community. And then um, Exchange, we launched in 2018, which is focused on tokenizing assets and making them exchangeable. So essentially creating data vaults and vaults for assets that can be stored um, in this virtual realm. And that we think is gonna be very important because as we move into a virtual world, you're going to have many different digital assets that may represent tokenized real assets like your property or your will or stocks and shares, but also new types of fully digital uh, stores of wealth. Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are just one example. And so a safe place to be able to store and, and vault those, those assets. And then finally, just a couple of months ago, we announced Propel, which is the final piece of the puzzle for us, and it's a governance platform. So instead of looking at a right or left governance model, we're looking at a forward-looking governance model, and it allows the members of our community to create uh, policies, planks, and points, and mesh those together into governance frameworks, and then to be able to vote on those governance frameworks and to export that data to any jurisdiction or any type of hub that a person in our community can create. So we're looking at uh, decentralized, granulated governance is the final component of this uh, beginning of a virtual nation. Thank you very much, well done. <laughs> it's very interesting to me, um, Stan Stelnacker was talking about the digital realm and we have obviously social media, even in Zimbabwe, is, is really impacting the, the new nations. But at the same time, we're living in this world which seems to be dominated by talk of here, even Brexit, the Trump-Russia scandal, et cetera. How do you find you know, airtime, in a sense, in this world environment to sort of push your, your cause for a new country? Is it creating a new moment in time where it's helping you to emerge with new, new nations and a new identity? Or is it 
that these bigger world issues are sort of sucking all the air out of the room and leaving nothing for new nations. Is, is this an issue for you? Please well, think, chip in. You know, of course, liberal line that the age of internet is something which is much easier to create uh, than before. I mean, we had in just first week alone, we had 250,000 people that applied for citizenship. I think that was never ever possible, that would be never ever possible without without internet, and we are still one of the fastest growing nation on the planet with around 500 to 1,000 people applying every day these days. So it is, of course, very important for us. I think also what is important and will be more important in this age of centralized social media, uh, the move to decentralized social media, where we will not, we will not be, have to be challenge, uh, mm -hmm. challenging the, the fact that all these centralized social media are actually going to prevent, for example, the growth of, of similar movements like ours. They're not going to influence the debate. And I think that will be a, a big next fight that, that you know, we are going to actually right. emerge into and, and will be on different levels. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, internet has done it, make it possible now for everybody on, on the planet to connect mm -hmm. and, and stand behind the ideas that they want. What about um, you, uh, Benny Wender? We have West Papua is one of the regions of the world that is, has obviously been the most traditional, the most tribal, I would presume the most unconnected, yet Benny Wender came to my attention through Twitter and he's had a, a remarkable referendum which was one of the most signed documents um, in history, I'm told. How do you, how do you manage <laughs> the, the social media realm and the the tribal world of, of West Papua. Yeah, thank you. This is uh, in world history, first time West Papua signed a petition one year undercover. Uh, 1,800,000 1, signed by the, my people. And smuggle, it's a very long story actually, from West Papua, crossed the border to Papua New Guinea mountain route, then to, took them to to me, the liver in London, and then I, I presented to. Um, People were literally handing a referendum it's around 40 villages. Kilo, <laughs> the whole 40 kilo, heavy weight, 40 kilo, this big, and uh, I handing over to the Human Rights High Commissioner in Geneva, first time in the history and world struggle as we did. So even there is no uh, mechanism, but at least because. Last 50 years, we shouting through the banner, self-determination referendum, and no one listened. Only way to sign the petition, deliver. So we did, and that the voice is I call uh, the bones of 500,000 men, women. 50 years we are fighting, so I did deliver. Uh, for us, for West Papuans, we are, it's most important now is the self-determination campaign or self-determination. This is our fundamental right to denial under the international law. Like uh, people of Western Sahara uh, and Western Sahara or Palestinians, uh, they fight for the, the right to self-determination. And of course, uh, Somaliland are uh, you know, uh, seeking for recognition. And um, um, I forget the name. Yes. You also seeking for recognition. For us, is we are still fighting. Uh, and under the Indonesian uh, illegal occupation. So that is the first time a successful delivered a petition. In fact, that our Indo Indonesia said this is just, you know, propaganda, but that is a people voice. And I, I am a, a chair of the United Liberation Movement. My obligation to deliver that message to the United Nations mm. because the UN is there for the, for, for, for receive all those concern, all those recognition. So that's why this petition is very important for me to deliver. I, I wonder, did anyone in the room ever hear about the United Nations you know, receiving a petition from West Papua? There was one, thank you. There was some intriguing news that it was denied uh, by the UN general. Can you just explain it just one minute or so what happened there? I, I, I read that the UN actually denied the existence of this pe petition, remarkably. Yes. Yes, I think the one, one uh, yeah, 2017, we also deliver uh, 
the petition in the uh, in the decolonization committee chair of decolonization committee that's independently we deliver uh, and then the chair of the decolonization committee deny because the, this is independently but in Geneva uh, sponsored by Vanuatu government uh, sponsored so we diplomatically uh, mm -hmm. uh, organized and then we deliver so, so of course our Indonesia always you know using propaganda language but this is this is fight is a lies and truth so whatever happened we deliver the, the, the petition to the United exactly. Nations, yeah. up to the United Nations. Yes. Um, I think Sakai Holland yes. wants to add to that. I wanted to I, um, follow a question I asked you, you didn't have time to answer. This whole thing of artificial intelligence and uh, virtual world and uh, all that, I always ask myself, how many women are involved in doing that? Uh, thing. How many people from Africa, where we have a philosophy of Ubuntu, the biggest um, gift Africa has to the world is our humanity, where you all came from. Um, so I asked, no, 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 on the issue of governance, no, no, I'm saying on the issue of governance, Thank you. Well which done. systems are we looking at? in terms of the governance that is once again coming out and being sent there. I'm just saying, I just want to register this worry for us because um, it, these are things that we receive, but we are not consulted and become part of. Mm -hmm. Vit, how many women do you have in your cabinet? What's the ratio? Right now, we've got a new minister of justice. No, I'm talking Sorry. about... Okay, sir. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think... Uh, But hang on, isn't that gender inequality? The first Australians, the th uh, Native Americans, all those are in, uh, consulted, the Africans with their diversity of brilliant philosophies. I just think that the world needs to be more integrated and more inclusive. Yeah. And it needs to have that basic grasp that the four parents of all civilizations re uh, survived to where we are today using peace-building methods. And I think in Western countries, my fear is that wherever I've gone, the brand of patriarchy has contaminated all the civilizations and given men in other societies more powers than they had mm. in it's their own. It's a good point. Uh, let, me, <laughs> let me applaud that and also ask the other panelists to okay. answer this. Thank you. you we, we have your answer, style. I, I want to give some air time here. I was asking uh, Vit Jalnikar, forgive my pronunciation, could you, Jedlikar, pardon me, to please let us know about your cabinet and also then uh, Benny Wender and the minister from Somaliland, could you please let us know about your know, diversity within your cabinet, the, the gender equity ratio? Well, for us, it's always a challenge, of course, with ventures like nation building, we, we can simply see that there is more men always interested in, in similar adventures. Uh, I mean, I, I don't know about your liberation movement, but probably the active members, I, I cannot help it. It's, it's the simple fact, it's one, one women, five men. Uh, but right now the cabinet is the same, but I, I'm happy that the most important position which we are now actually having is occupied by woman, but not because she is woman, but she because she's got the best skill set to occupy that position. And I think that that's very important when women are not put in a place is just because they are women, they but because they are the true leaders right. and they've got the capacity. But one of how many, I'm sorry, in the cabinet? <laughs> what is it? Sorry. One of how many, one woman of how yeah, many we've in got the cabinet? Four members of cabinet and one, one of them is, is women. Okay. But, you know, it, but again, you know, I, truly believe, I truly believe that it is part of, of basic 
dignity for women that they are not put into places just because they are women. I, I truly mm -hmm. believe it is kind of their task to prove that they are, the, and we have not chosen our Minister of Justice just because she mm -hmm. is women, but seriously, mm -hmm. because she is the best that we have in the whole network of all male lawyers and people that are into the international border disputes. Uh, she is a, a great, very well-known international lawyer uh, from London, and, and I'm very okay, proud we, of we that. We have to move on to some other yeah. questions and, and also to hear from the other panelists on that issue, so I have to cut you, but thank you for your answer. Uh, let's hear very briefly, yeah. please, briefly from Minister Awad and also Benny Wender about the diversity in your cabinets, and then I would like to invite questions also and comments. So, you. in my country, you know, uh, the female, they have been, you know, the foreign minister, they have been the minister of finance, you know, we don't have any sensitivity when it's coming to the female, although, you know, oh, we are a nation, uh, you know, have a, uh, uh, what I can say, norms of, you know, uh, male dominating and everything, because, you know, uh, every successful man behind the woman, and, if, you know, during the uh, war, you know, we fight for the independence. You know, a lot of fathers passed away. So, you know, our generation, my generation, especially, you know, raised by uh, strong women. Okay. So, so we are, so our right now, uh, female representation is we have three uh, uh, ministers in the cabinet. Three ministers. Okay, Benny Wender, tell us uh, about West Papua and your independence movement and the role of women and the numbers of women that you're bringing into leadership. Yeah, <clears throat> for our case, it's West Papua is, uh, we are uh, united under the one flag called Morning Star. It's a Morning Star, it's a very important symbol and identity. And um, of course, 57 years, we're under the Indonesian illegal occupation. We are, you know, s s s split one another. But now, we, uh, under the help, help of uh, Vanuatu government, we unite under the United, uh, one organization called United Liberation Movement. In this first time in the history of our struggle, so the women and men now, they play a key role, and also we have activists, and uh, activists internationally and nationally. So this is, they bring us unite, and so uh, this unity uh, make, make us stronger and also, you may know this, originally we have the Pacific collecting uh, Micronesia, Polynesia, Melanesia. We are unite through the music. Our collectively music is a very powerful machine to drive us, bring together to, to liberate people of West Papua. So in terms of the, or our organization, we have a United Liberation Movement. Is We have all the leaders inside and executive outside. Because why executive outside? Many leaders have been killed. I myself, the last man I left uh, in the country because many leaders were killed. I was escaped first time in the history of struggle. So now I brought that message to out. But legislative judiciary in West Papua, we have a seven bureau in West Papua. We have a, now, they have a diplomat all over the world, but we, we kept this uh, unity uh, or collectiveness. That's a powerful machine that we have now. So I think that more or less. Thank you. Uh, I would like to go to uh, the, the audience, but you, you, you may have a very quick Can, can I just clarify one thing? It might be looking that I'm the leading figure in Liberland, but I will tell you a small secret. It's not me. It's my first lady that is running the show. Okay, the first lady <laughs> running the show. All right, l please let us know your question. And, and your, your name, please. It's fairly easy, you fly to Belgrade, Osijek, or Budapest, and then it's, then it's like two hour ride from Osijek, it's only 40 minutes. Uh, you can, you're very welcome to again join us for the anniversary, which is taking place in, um, the, the conference itself is in Sombor, but on the whole Saturday we're actually going to be in Liberland, and we're building a small city on water next to our territory, in our territorial waters right now because of the security issues. But 
Again, Liberland is a physical piece of land. It is located between Croatia and Serbia. It's only 10 kilometers away from Hungarian borders. It's not hard to reach it. It just takes a couple hours of, of ride. In, from Serbia, it's actually the, the, the best way to get there. From Croatia, the Croatia is enforcing the Croatian Liberland borders very strongly. They arrest people that are trying to get outside of Schengen zone into Liberland right now. From Serbia, we've got borders on the Danube River, which is international waterway, uh, waterway and that makes it much easier to, to come and access. But we still do have issues with Croatia, which I hope to solve. We are very honored when we have a leader of Croatian opposition coming to, coming to our uh, anniversary, and I hope we will solve these issues I with Croatia. To. Serbia stated they don't mind creation of Liberland on this territory, despite them being the former owners and, and uh, the sovereign entity running this piece of land. I'm sorry, I think um, Sakai Holland would like to... No, no, I've got to go, and I just want to leave one little message to the meeting to say to Frank, thank you very much for the forum you've established, but we need to really rethink how we use this space as a global forum where we bring our ideas together. I just wanted to say, Africa's future is for me guaranteed because of the founding fathers, the Nkrumahs, the Jomo Kenyatta's, uh, who really set up the whole thing of the OAU, say Abu Bakr, Tafawa, Balewa, all those. And that there was a first phase, a second phase, and the third phase so well articulated by the Namibian ambassador. So if you want to hear what's happening in Africa, listen to what the different regimes are saying. Sadak, thank you, Seko, we, we were going, going to thank you yes. for being here. We have to stick to yes. our uh, so, panelists and comments. But, yeah, I but I'm saying Sekai Holland has a taxi waiting at uh, 12 o'clock yes. uh, to, to have to, to run. But yes. thank you very but, much for having us. But Wendy, I'm here. saying to you that I don't think that people here have quite understood how disconnected humanity is from the source which is where we have been able to build planet Earth. Mm -hmm. We still have the capacity to build forward by connecting. Thank you. Well, I want to connect with the audience right now. So thank you very much for your contribution. I know we have uh, some people who have questions. OK, please. Do we have any more questions? Yes. I So let me let me answer. Mm -hmm. So thank you so much for that question. You know uh, it is nice that you know African leaders and African intellectuals are ge getting together to solve, you know, their own problem and also realizing that, you know, the, the dependence will not take them to the development. So I have to congratulate to them, but still they are, you know, African unions, they are denying us to join them. We are just fighting for our existence. We are a country that you cannot find in the map. You know, and also, you know, our, uh, I can say our mother uh, uh, nation, Somalia, they are weaker than, than, than us. Somalia is more strong than Somalia, but we are just respecting uh, the rules and regulation and standards of international. Uh, you know, still, you know, when the cent their central government collapse, still they are trying to be more strong. We are praying for them. Uh, but you know the international community just gave the legitimacy of government to them instead of Somaliland. 
and Somalia fulfilled everything, every condition of, of sovereignty. But when it's coming to the deployment and something like that, uh, Somalia, when it's coming to the budget, 100% uh, uh, we don't receive any foreign aid from the budget. We collect and we spend it. So I think we have we a model. We have a model uh, that we can, we can contribute to Africa and to the rest of the world. You know, we are self-dependent. Uh, so thank you very much for that question. Thank you. We only have a few minutes left, so I need to keep people very tight on your questions and answers. Yes, sir. Please stand. Well, so, a, a very quick yeah, well, With Liberland, we try to combine the best elements of republic, democracy, and meritocracy. The, because Liberland was founded on birthday of Thomas Jefferson, we took a lot of things from the American Constitution. We got inspired by the Swiss, for example, public veto model. And we, we changed the relation between the state and citizen to a degree that is completely voluntary. In Liberland, we don't have any obligatory tax system. And then whenever you're paying taxes, you're actually getting merits, which is your reputation and your vote in Liberland, which I think is a fundamental improvement to existing systems. Excellent, yes. So our, our constitution is, you know, based on uh, Sharia law, so it is revelation from the God. So, uh, and also our constitution is based on the clans and the power distribution, and, and everybody is happy about how we are uh, created and established and organized our constitution. So. You know, we managed, and we never uh, met any challenges from the last 27 years. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been fantastic to have these leaders here and to have your contribution. I'm sure you have more questions, so please come and find uh, these gentlemen outside at the end now. I can see more hands coming up. I'd like to thank Dr. Frank Jurgen Richter for having this exceptional topic and people here to join us. And thank you to Cascais and Portugal. It is uh, an honor for us to be here and it's a, a fine country that's inspiring us all. So thank you all for joining us today.